Welcome to Nature's Edge for your news from where nature and human nature meet, from climate and environment to animal intelligence, human psychology, and all the economies of life. Coming to you today from New York's Central Park, where we've been watching a number of squirrels hunting around, apparently trying to remember where they buried the acorns. And our special guest today is Eugene Linden, author of The Octopus and Orangutan, and a number of other books about thinking in animals and humans and how they think about each other. This is the next in our series, Thinking About Thinking with Eugene and Other Animals, a subject he's been studying for more than 40 years. And of course, we'll have our trip up the viewer question. What is ethology, and who is Donald Griffin, and what might they have to do with each other? And to get started, before we talk further with Eugene about animal intelligence, we're going to take a trip to Moscow. Here's ABC's Alexander Marquardt. Every so often, riding Moscow's busy subway, you may notice that the commuters around you include a dog, on its own, a stray, riding along beneath the streets and neighborhoods of the great city. There are some 30 to 35,000 strays in Moscow. You see them everywhere, markets, construction sites, and underground passageways, adapting to the world they were born in. Moscow stray dogs have gotten so used to living in this big city, scrounging for food, that some have started getting around the way millions of Moscovites do every day on the metro. That's where we found this female, among the crowds in the Kievskaya station. We couldn't even keep up with her as she zipped between the legs to get through the doors for a ride on the Koltsevaya line. She seemed to feel safe among the humans around her, and with reason. After all, the subway dogs even have their own statue down here. This is Malchik, a stray dog who lived in one of Moscow's busy subway stations. One night in 2002, a fashion model was walking past with her terrier, and Malchik barked at them. She took a knife out of her purse and stabbed him to death. Muscovites were outraged and placed this bronze statue here as a memorial. Passersby now rub his nose for good luck. Dr. Andrei Poyarkov is a biologist who has studied Moscow strays for 30 years. In Moscow, there are all sorts of stray dogs, he says, but there are no stupid dogs. The street is tough and it's survival of the fittest. These clever dogs know people much better than people know them. He says only a small fraction of Moscow strays figure out how to navigate the giant maze of the subway system, like the dog we found. But they are a minority that have gained recognition on YouTube and other websites. Alexei Vereshagin is a graduate student who works with Dr. Poyarkov. He plans to do a PhD on Moscow strays. Vereshagin says what's most impressive about the subway dogs is they've figured out how to deal with the stresses of loud trains and the large crowds that domesticated dogs often cannot handle. It's stressing even for people staying in a crowd. And the dogs are lying down, so no one is seeing them. So everyone could put a full feet on them, and but they get used to this and not jumping to, from side to and I'm just lying down and having fun and having pleasure, just lying there. We rode around Moscow Center several times with our new friend while she slept on the floor. At times, she had a brief conversation. It was as if she knew that such close quarters were no place for her to appear threatening. When we got back to the station where she first got on, she lifted her head as if she recognized it. Yeah, they figured out the concrete station and somehow know where to get out and how to get inside. And maybe by the announcement of the diction, maybe of some smells, maybe some just uh, by, by the sight. But anyway, they, they see it and they know how to do this. That's incredible. The dogs are quite clever. <laughs> Poyarkov says the subway dogs learn specific stations and routes. He calls this type of dog a superior beggar. They've figured out where to sit, where humans are most likely to offer food. So much, they can even be a bit choosy. The stray dogs of Moscow have come up with a variety of techniques for turning humans into a food source. When the dog's sometimes trying to frighten you from behind with barking, and you drop the food and they're taking it, they're not, bi not biting you, not attacking you, just making one bark, even jumping up and barking from your behind. You think, oh, and dropping the food, and they're taking a the food and going away. Vera Shagan says a pack sometimes sends out the smaller, cuter dogs to beg for food because they've figured out the bigger, less attractive dogs aren't as successful. They've also learned how to deal with Moscow's infamous traffic. 
I've seen many times how the dogs are crossing the street on a green light, even the, not really just with people, but even at night when there is no people and no cars, the dogs are waiting for the green light. It's not all rosy between the two species. Many Muscovites see the tens of thousands of homeless dogs as a big problem. This is a problem and we have to solve it. And they're not guilty that they became homeless. And uh, we, we should uh, solve this problem in a humane way. It's not really easy to completely move the dogs off, off the street. And I guess we have to just to know how to learn how to live with them. The stray dogs of Moscow, including the subway commuters, have themselves already done a lot to work for peaceful integration. Alex Marquardt, ABC News, Moscow. Our thanks to Alex in Moscow. Eugene, that's a remarkable story. Yeah, it's, it's remarkable in a number of respects. One, it, it shows that animals aren't just passive wind-up toys. They're trying to make the best of human society or the circumstances they find themselves in. If there was a cat that rode the bus in England, um, for a number of years, uh, and the owner never knew what it was doing, but the bus driver did and the other passengers did. But the, the takeaway is that animals are not just passive in this. They're, they're figuring out what we're about and how they can game the system and work it to their advantage as well. In other words, they're adapting to the human worlds that we've built, if we stop and think about it, shows us how they react to the wilderness, because to them it's all wilderness. Well. It's the, it's the environment that they're growing up in. There was this one case of an orangutan at the Woodland Park Zoo in Seattle who a, a piece of rope got into his cage. And uh, Helen Schumann, a trainer, they offered him a treat to pay out the rope. And uh, Tawan, the orangutan's name, figured out that, gee, I'll just give him a little bit of rope. Maybe I'll get another treat. And they gave him another treat. He paid out more of the rope, so on and so forth. So he literally got to the end of his rope. <laughs> And then he figured out the game's over, so he, uh, Ryan Hanks are very strong, pulled the rope back into his cage to restart the negotiations. So that, I mean, it shows that uh, here's an animal, you know, figuring out, gee, I, I might be able to extract a little extra rent from these humans around me by, by, by gaming the system. You have so many animal stories, and first when people hear about this, they think, well, these are just a bunch of nice, cute animal stories. Well, the stories are fun, but they, the stakes just couldn't be higher.